Okay, well this topic is a little orthogonal to most of what's being presented here, but the term proteomics has appeared multiple times in presentations about the integration of omics levels of inquiry, and sometimes the term proteomics has been conspicuously missing in slides where it should be present, like that precision medicine report from the Institute of Medicine National Academy of Sciences that Paul showed where they left out proteins and metabolites altogether, as if you could predict from gene sequences post-translational modifications of proteins and splice variants at the transcript and protein level, which you cannot, as I hope you all know. There's a lot of biology in those levels of complexity. So uh, this is a bit of a reach, but uh, actually I've been on a campaign since we talked about going from 1.1 to 1.2 18 months ago, uh, we have Institute for Systems Biology as a partner and Lee Hood on the board of the Transmart Foundation with their specific interest in having proteomics and protein, proteome data resources incorporated into Transmart. Similarly for the regulome, which is also of interest. So it seems timely given the uh, rapid acceleration of activity around the Human Proteome Project to share uh, what's going on with you for 30 minutes. Uh, the background is here that uh, 13 years ago, these two covers appeared the same weekend. How many of you have copies? They're collector items. <laughs> And of course, uh, this was supposed to be the completion of the human genome, which is still incomplete. Um, five days later, five days later, and the uh, inside cover page in the Financial Times of London appeared this story. It's my favorite cartoon. Can you find DNA? Yes? Center stage is a big globular protein. And off stage, in the shadows, is the double helix over here. Okay, and the headline is, the next holy grail, deciphering the proteome, all the proteins. Now, all the proteins actually is a much bigger challenge than all the genes. Although there are modifications of genes too, like all the methylation and some other changes. But proteins undergo very important function-driving changes of their uh, side chains, and other features, including proteolysis. So here's the pitch. From genomes to phenotypes must go through the proteome. Proteins, the major action molecules of the cells. Proteins and their isoforms are highly dynamic in concentration and temporal effects. Play critical roles in gene regulation. Need to be understood through pathways and networks. Uh, there's been tremendous progress, just as with the genome, in instruments, reagents, bioinformatics, to facilitate integration and modeling of the data from proteomics in the context of all omics platforms. And, very importantly for this Transmart community, uh, proteins are the primary targets of drugs. And, of course, there are now many, many protein drugs, as well as the source of biomarkers. So here's the familiar uh, faster than Moore's law reduction in the cost of genome sequencing or nucleic acid sequencing. Um, something related to this, I will mention in a few minutes, is going on in proteomics as well. Here's the now familiar uh, grand slide from phenome to genome and genome to phenome. You can start from the phenotype and work back, start from the genotype and work forward, but you really need to capture the information at multiple levels. So I like to say that it's a new world. We used to teach in science policy that you go from basic research to applied research to technology, commercial application. But in fact, technology is a huge driver for basic research. It enables us to do experiments, studies, that we could not possibly have done without the technology. And the truth is it enables us to think about new concepts and new hypotheses that were not triggered without the technology and the feasibility of doing such studies. The rest of this I've just covered. There is this path that uh, Lee Hood has called P4, predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory. 
and maybe somewhat precise. Now, the focus on the uh, Human Proteome Project. This is organized by the Human Proteome Organization, a 13-year-old entity, sort of like Hugo. And it's been progressive in the last several years. Um, as you can see here, not only a lot of meetings, but there are now more than 90 publications, and there's a lot of real progress. These are the two overall goals. The big one is the first. That is to make proteomics a full counterpart to genomics in the modern molecular studies that we bring to bear for biomedicine and for all life sciences. The second is the sort of stepwise production of a full parts list. Now, the full parts list is a big order. We're starting by saying we want to find highly credible evidence of the expression of at least one protein product from every one of the approximately 20,000 protein coding genes in the human. And, of course, we'd like to also begin the long-term process of characterizing the post-translational modifications, single nucleotides, single amino acid, non-synonymous uh, polymorphisms, and splice variants. The number of protein coding genes, as you probably know, has been quite a fascinating story. When we started the Genome Project, people confidently predicted 50 to 100,000 protein coding genes. When those two covers appeared, those covers were accompanied by multiple articles, which consensus was about 35,000 protein coding genes. It's been shrinking. This is like, you know, a shrinking mystery person. Um, it's down to 20,000. And in fact, you can see here that our best number now is 19,490. And that's probably going to settle out there. This is the vision of the Human Proteome Project. Uh, we start with pillars, resource pillars, from mass spectrometry, which is the method for identifying spectra, which enable us to infer peptide sequences, and then match the peptide sequences to gene-driven databases for the expected protein sequence. But matching to protein sequences often leads to ambiguous matches because of the very similar sequences in some proteins and expected very similar, if not identical, sequences in members of highly homologous protein families. ABS stands for antibodies, antibody profiling. This is another way to detect proteins and identify especially the expression in tissues or in organelles within cells. And KB refers to knowledge base, which is a big part of our total project. The other features here are in little fine print. This is biology-driven projects from many biological processes and disease categories. And over here, we call this the adopt a chromosome. So just like the Genome Project, we have divided up the work among the 24 human chromosomes. Here's the organizational feature, the features I just told you. Uh, here's the list, very international executive committee for this uh, project, similar to what Transmart has become. And here's how we got started. In 2001, when we began the Human Proteome Organization, we wanted to uh, advance the field, provide training, and especially organize initiatives around biofluids, around uh, organs, and around protein standards, antibodies, glycoproteome, and technologies. We did all of that, and all that has now been uh, rolled up into this HPP. So we had plasma, liver, brain, kidney, urine, cardiovascular from the beginning. We added model organisms for comparative proteomics, very important from the experience with genomics, but for blood stem cells, and now also diabetes, cancers, cancers in the plural, always please, infectious diseases, autoimmune disorders, the eye, epigenetics, mitochondria, and this year, pediatrics, respiratory disorders, protein aggregation disorders, and a companion piece on computational mass spectrometry. It gives you some idea of the uh, excitement and activity in this project. Now, the uh, BD, what we call the biology and disease-driven part of the HPP, has these goals. The first was to capture the potential of targeted proteomics. How many of you are aware of discovery and targeted proteomics approaches? 
Very few. Okay. So the point is, when you do mass spectrometry of tryptic digest, tryptic trypsin, the enzyme digests proteins into convenient size fragments, but they're very variable size. They, this enzyme is specific. It cleaves only at lysine or arginine, nowhere else. So you get a lot of peptides. The more abundant the protein, the more abundant the peptides. So the result is you're always measuring the most known proteins over and over and over. It's a big problem. Once you've done that and you have some logic from pathways analysis, networks analyses, disease studies of which proteins may be most relevant for the questions you want to address, it is possible to design targeted proteomics methods using selected reaction monitoring, this is a kind of mass spectrometry approach, where you measure only the peptides you're interested in. And they should be proteotypic peptides, which occur only in one protein each. So you have a label for that protein. And you can do, in the mass spec, you get multiple transitions. You actually have multiple uh, reinforcing observations. So this is a very powerful method. And groups in Zurich and Seattle work together to create proteotypic peptides and synthesized peptides for every one of those 20,000 protein coding genes. Spectral library that's available, open source to everybody. Reagents provided by certain companies. SRM, Selected Reaction Monitoring Atlas. And PASO, which is the resource, it's the experimental uh, data set library for the results from SRM studies. These are both housed at the Institute for Systems Biology. And now from Zurich, something called SWATH, which is a data independent acquisition method that screens through the uh, spectral range and allows you to focus in on those. It's a much more complete analysis. Doesn't require looking and producing in advance all the peptides that you want to study. It enables you to pull them out by a computational method, which is complementary to the SRM itself. So this is done. This is a great service to the community. I'm sorry to tell you that the pickup from people who don't know anything about mass spectrometry has been rather slow. People in the field, of course, are using it, but it's something to know about and learn about and encourage appropriate colleagues to look at and use. Second approach is to build from biological studies, disease studies, um, reasonable sized lists like 35 proteins for diabetes, uh, maybe 108 proteins for ovarian cancer, cancers, um, workable lists of priority, or somebody calls them popular proteins, for particular diseases. Cardiovascular, there's such a list for aortic aneurysms, for example. But this has just been launched. And uh, this is a service to people who are working in the field and want to know where they should start if you want to be able to have a tractable uh, list of proteins for potential analysis of the biology and the clinical features. And third, there's an initiative involving multiple vendor companies around producing a proteome analyzer. Now, this is like the uh, better than Moore's law for genome sequencing. The quality and resolution of mass spectrometers at the high end has been advanced remarkably. It's really astonishing. You can now do in a single run uh, confident identification of thousands of proteins, maybe 10,000 of the 20,000 and only hardly any more are expressed in a given cell type. But what we really need is a much more robust, lower cost, high throughput instrument that could be utilized in the clinical laboratories and in epidemiological studies instead of deep dives on one sample or a few samples the way most proteomics is still being done. And this is coming along. There's a lot of interest among the companies. There are at least three that are working on this. Maybe many more are not talking about it. Now, some people have said, this is proteomics, proteins. Proteins aren't organized by chromosome. Their genes could be anywhere. And to a large extent, that is true. So why are we doing a chromosome-centric part of this project? First is the analogy to the genome. The second is the division of labor. So we have 24 different teams, uh, geographically dispersed, and uh, it's a great opportunity for people to show leadership and do something that's feasible. 
on the average, there's less than 1,000 genes per chromosome. 20,000 is a awfully big number to annotate and study in great detail. But the third reason here is the most important, that there's real biology behind this, and it's in the feature of co-expression of genes that are co-located. And the extreme, this is described as an amplicon. How many have heard of the term amplicon? Okay, well, we're particularly, I'm on chromosome 17 with Michael Snyder from Stanford and Bill Hancock in Boston and Ron Beavis in Canada. And we've done some very interesting things on chromosome 17. I don't really have time to show you today, but the heart of it is we're interested in breast cancers and BRCA1 is on chromosome 17, ERB2 is on chromosome 17, HER2 new, TP53 is on chromosome 17. But around ERB2, there are 23 genes whose protein products are expressed together or may be expressed together. Anywhere from one, two, up to 23 of these 23 may be found expressed, highly overexpressed together in particular HER2 new positive cancers and probably contributes to the variability observed in patients and the variability of response and variability of diagnosis, which is usually brushed under the rug when we talk about how great Herceptin is as a breakthrough targeted therapy. Here's the geographic map. Um, so you see there's three in China, three in Korea, three in the US, two in Canada, many other countries. It's really exciting stuff and requires a lot of international travel, as you can imagine. Uh, this is a diagram from our friend in Korea who's head of the uh, CHPP, showing how we want to bring the disease approach, the chromosome approach together. Most of the chromosome teams have picked a particular uh, disease focus, preeclampsia, gastric cancers, glioblastoma, etc. What's happened here? Mm. As I said, we've had a lot of publications. I don't want to go through this in detail, but most of the chromosome groups and, and now most of the uh, biology groups have publications, and we're trying to get more and more connection across them. Now, I want to talk the rest of the time about the bioinformatics for this. Uh, we have created metrics and a master table and a pie chart. And those are sort of the take-home points for this talk. Starting point, how many of the 20,000 or so protein coding genes, for how many of them do we have confident evidence of a protein product being expressed somewhere, sometime in humans? Conversely, how many are missing? And here, missing means no evidence, which is true for quite a lot of them, or insufficient evidence, documentation, to warrant our fairly stringent criteria being met to say it's confidently identified. Some of them we need to recognize will never be found by mass spectrometry. They have no sites for tryptic cleavage. They are buried inside a seven transmembrane uh, membrane structure. And we have competing, or at least now uh, coordinated, data resources. Ensemble, which may be familiar to all of you, and Nexpro, which may not. Nexpro is the human only portion of the Uniprot KB uh, operated between the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics in Geneva and EBI in Cambridge, Hingston. Uh, they provide the number of protein coding genes for us. Then Peptide Atlas at ISB and GPMDB in Canada perform a reanalysis of all the primary raw spectra data. This is a tremendous service because every Mass spectrometer has its own uh, embedded search engine with parameters not fully disclosed. And every investigator has different criteria and there are a zillion settings. And it leads to a very big problem, not to mention that there is a fundamental ambiguity, as I mentioned earlier, in the matching of a peptide sequence to one or several or many protein sequences that contain that peptide sequence. So what uh, Peptide Atlas does with something called the Transproteomic Pipeline, Peptide Profit, Protein Profit, MyU Adjustment, and GPM does with X Tandem, is to take the primary spectra, put them through the standardized pipeline, uh, introduce uh, 
1% uh, FOSS discovery rate at the protein level, not just the peptide level or the spectral level, which some people use uh, f from Peptide Atlas, and the expect value, which is stringent for the GPM. And then we take those data and build them into NextProt, which provides extensive curation of all the information, not just from mass spectrometry, which is what I've discussed up to here, but also from sequencing and from crystal structures and from other sources of information uh, showing clear presence of protein. Then there's an orthogonal approach called the Human Protein Atlas, uh, based in Stockholm, fantastic project, now in its uh, 13th version, actually on November 6th, Science Magazine will have a, a big poster built into the issue, and uh, it's about the tissue expression of proteins based on immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence, 66 cell types, 48 tissues, certain diseases, and a very uh, notable project. There are a couple of additional laboratory-specific databases, which I may mention if I get to them right now, uh, that are pretty controversial this particular summer. So, uh, one other thing we accomplished in this project is to create proteome exchange. This took several years, but we now have a system where everybody is supposed to contribute their data sets to either EBI Pride or PASO at Institute for Systems Biology, if it's Tandem MS-MS or SRM, and uh, you get a protein uh, identifier, a PXD identifier, and we say it should go in the last line of the abstract in the method so people can see immediately where they can find all of your data, and hopefully sufficient metadata. This is a big issue. So here are the numbers, and we could spend a lot of time on this, but the bottom line is that there's about 20,000 protein coding genes, of which uh, 616 we have declared not credible at the gene level. Let's say they are listed by ensemble as dubious or uncertain genes, not just about protein. This is the next pro number of protein evidence. This is the uh, peptide atlas number, the most stringent and the more relaxed version. We go with the 14,900. This number is similar, but it's not uh, finalized yet. It's being released shortly. And this will be out in November, as I said. These are the numbers by chromosome. So for every chromosome group, we give them the evidence of what's, which proteins have been confidently identified and confirmed by this elaborate group process, and which ones are missing. So they can focus on those to the extent they have the capacity. And here is a pie chart that shows a little different way. Um, the big red area here, 13,000 plus, this was for 2013, are those that are validated by mass spectrometry and confirmed by curation by NEXPRO. These are all in Peptide Atlas. These are additional ones not in Peptide Atlas, but from mass spectrometry, just because of not all data sets have been processed yet. These are non-mass spectrometry evidence, like Edmund sequencing or crystal structures. These are the ones that we say we don't believe, and these are the 4,000, 3844, that we're missing. Let's keep that number, 3844. Now, the way this works is there are protein evidence levels. The highest level is really discovered by mass spectrometry or antibody profiling or sequencing, let's say the next protein number at a high confidence. This is not protein evidence at all. These are predicted proteins for which the only evidence is the transcript level. But it does tell you if the transcript has been found confidently and with certain quantitation that you might have a good idea where to look for protein if that's what you're trying to find. And then there's some more details of these smaller categories. Here's the 2014 update. So that 3844 is now 2948. We gained almost a well, 900 in one year out of this uh, less than 4,000. That's pretty good progress. Now, strategies for finding these missing proteins is to start from the transcriptome distribution, to analyze samples from fetal 
uh, our uh, embryonic samples. Um, to use other ways of preparing specimens than triptych digestion, that's say try other enzymes or special ways of uh, solubilizing proteins from membranes. To figure out how to deal with this question of uh, highly homologous sequences. To look for proteins that might only be expressed under certain conditions. And there's a whole category, a family of proteins called beta defensins, which are antimicrobial polypeptides, which probably are expressed only under stress of infection or inflammation. Uh, of course, then there's this enormous family of uh, olfactory receptor genes, which I'll come to in a minute. So this here, among the thousands of data sets, there are five really big ones that stand out. The first is a big update on the human protein atlas. Let's hold that aside, it's the antibody approach. The second is a paper using seven different proteolytic enzymes to see if you get more information if you use other enzymes than trypsin. Surprising finding is you get more coverage, you get more peptides, but you didn't find many more proteins. Very interesting. The third is the release of proteomics results now, uh, lagging by a few years to work on the uh, mutation analysis of uh, TCGA, and then National Cancer Institute studies of so far and here, colon and breast have been incorporated into peptide atlas and uh, ovarian, excuse me, colon and ovarian have been incorporated into uh, peptide atlas and breast has just been released, not yet in. And then there are these last two papers, which are an enormous story, but I just want you to be aware of them. Uh, these were published back to back in Nature, which is not a standard proteomics journal, by an ambitious editor who thought it would be great if you could say that proteome is nearly done. So these two highly competent groups with large numbers of samples and some unusual tissue types with high-end equipment published really nice work, but used quite lax criteria in declaring the confidence of the identification. So when we have reprocessed these two big data sets, which claim approximately 18,000 of the 20,000, we get about 13,000. And uh, there's quite a little negotiation, or I won't even say there's negotiation, shall we say discussion. In Madrid, this is a very active point. And to give you a sense of it, uh, here's this one. Well, this is the most dramatic since time is up. This is from a group in Munich. They used FDR 1% with 1 billion spectra. 1% of a billion is a big number, right? 100,000 false positives. They used 5% for the peptides with another kind of adjustment which was partially effective. When our, my colleague in Canada, the head of the GPM, used a probe, he says, well, let's look and see if how they do on the Y chromosome specified proteins. Well, do you expect to find Y chromosome genes expressed in ovary, for example? You might if there's a homologue that's on the X chromosome, which there is, but he excluded those. And he still found that they claim seven proteins that have no coding anywhere except on the Y to be expressed in ovary. These are clearly ambiguous matches. But the biggest thing, a group in Spain looked at the olfactory receptors. Nobel Prize has been won for olfactory receptor genes, but olfactory receptor proteins are a rare claim. And olfactory receptor transcripts are a rare claim. In any case, no tissues that are known to have uh, olfactory receptor genes active were studied by either group. Maybe they're produced in testis or in some other tissue. So one paper reported 108, the other had 200, and when folks went through and did what the authors should have done, which was to examine carefully, manually validate the spectra themselves, not just a, uh, an automated analysis, not a single one was confirmed as having credible spectra. Okay? And the same thing happened when we did the automated analysis, my colleagues did the automated analysis at ISB, 
and in Canada using the peptide atlas and the GPMDB. So uh, we have 15 years since those heady days of the uh, 2001, almost 15 years, and the holy grail of going for the proteome. We made a lot of progress. Uh, we've been on a steady path to more reproducible, more reliable standards for identification, quantitation, annotation, integration. I'd say we had a little setback with the high publicity act of nature. But uh, we're going to work that out. And um, we have adopted data submission guidelines. We've implemented quality thresholds. And even these newest analyses serve to reinforce the need to explore new ways of generating data and dealing with very large aggregated data sets. So we have in place with Proteome Exchange for submission of data and distribution of data freely with the open access Peptide Atlas and these other resources and with lots more data coming, I think it is time to figure out how to link Transmart to Peptide Atlas, Nexpro, and the Human Protein Atlas to enable those interested who want to find what they can to annotate at the protein level and to find in Nexpro hundreds of thousands of uh, post-translational modifications and splice variants. There's tremendous wealth of information that would be very valuable in annotating any omics analysis starting with genes and epigenomic regulation. And all of this can be tied to pathways, networks, interactions, visualization, and drug ability. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gil. Uh, I'll, I'll add the uh, specialized resource of the proteomics uh, commons to the uh, content committee discussion this afternoon. I think that's where it really belongs. Right. I mean, we've got to do something about this. This is a huge resource for us to take advantage of. Um, any one, one quick question for Gil? We've got to get to our group photo. And Kevin is uh, he's standing by here like a <laughs> drill sergeant, getting ready to uh, march us down. I, he's, he says the sun is out, so we're going out to a very pretty yeah, place Yeah, notice outside. the trees. I think we're going to the st steps of the Rackham Auditorium across the street. So any, any questions for Gil first? Happy to be uh, accosted later. Yeah, good. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. I want to learn more about this nature pandy thing. I mean, it uh, sounds awful. Okay, Kevin, why don't you...